All right, so let's continue with testing. At a very abstract level, testing works that like this. We have test cases, scenarios that we actually test. We process them and we check the results. Um, what's very important to keep in mind, however, is that uh, if your tests succeed, then this does not mean that you do not have errors. So if your tests fail, then of course this shows that there is an error present. But uh, if your tests succeed, that does not mean there is no error. It just means that your tests have not found any errors. So let me try to illustrate this. Um, if we have a system and a set here in blue, the set of all possible test cases, then even if we have a really simple system, let's say it's a method that only takes in one 32-bit integer and outputs one 32-bit integer, then the set of all input test cases is already all possible 32-bit numbers. That means that's something like um, 4 billion possible test cases. So it's quite obvious that even for a really simple system, we will never be able to test all possible test cases. Um, we can only ever test a subset. This is inside this, this dashed line, for example. And now inside the set of all possible test cases, we have an, a subset, which uh, are the inputs which actually trigger an error. And um, now it's quite obvious that your test cases will only uh, at best hit some part of that subset. In a perfect world, they will hit all of them, so you can find all errors, but you don't know them in advance, of course. So you can only guess what test cases will be suitable for finding errors, and then you will hit some small subset here um, of those uh, cases that actually cause uh, errors. Then you run these test cases through your system, and then you get some output results. And again, you will only get a subset of outputs that actually tell you that an error has happened. So ideally, for those errors, you uh, for those uh, inputs you, uh, you use in here, the intersection of those test cases you actually use and those that cause errors. Um, this will reveal a small part of the outputs that indicate that uh, an error has occurred. Um, but there's still a large amount of test cases that re might reveal other errors that you haven't used yet. And consequently, there's also a large amount of outputs that you have not seen yet that indicate uh, errors. So even if you fix all of these issues in here, in this intersection, then um, all your test cases will pass and you will not get any outputs that uh, show any errors. But that doesn't mean that there are not yet, not still uh, uh, quite a number of po possible error cases left that you just have not seen yet. So for this reason, it's very important to keep in mind that um, failing tests can, of course, indicate the presence of errors, but um, Passing tests do not uh, actually prove the absence of errors. They're, they only prove that there are no errors in your test cases. But as you never can test all possible inputs, um, you will usually always miss at least some parts of those inputs that actually cause errors. So this is a really important fundamental aspect of testing. Oops. Uh, wrong direction again, I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, in general, we're talking about two different types of tests. One is uh, validation testing. This is designed to show that the software actually does what it's supposed to, that it meets its, requ its requirements. And here the test cases are designed to look like typical use cases. So you can maybe actually get real data from the customer and uh, run that through your system. And then if it's processed correctly, then your system has been validated. And on the other hand, we also have defect testing or verification testing. And here the obvious idea is that we want to find errors, like in the previous diagram. Um, and here now, that means that we use atypical data or data that we know to be, uh, to be wrong and feed that into the system and check how it's, how it's handled. If uh, the, we get a complete uh, failure, a crash, um, stack overflow or whatever, or um, if the system actually just 
shows an error message and tells us the data is wrong. That's the ideal case. So um, this is the difference between those two, two aspects of testing. On the one hand, we want to, of course, show that our software can handle typical data. And on the other hand, we want to see how our software handles atypical data, which co intentionally contains errors um, to, see, to see if we can f spot any flaws in our design. All right, so we have quite a number of different stages of testing. Of course, we have testing during development, uh, divided into uh, unit, component, and system testing. Um, then we also have release testing before we actually uh, hand it out. We have performance testing um, to see if we can hit some performance target maybe with our software or if it performs better than some, some kind of competition. And we also have user testing where we actually see how users can, can deal with the software and if they can understand the user interface and so on. So for the moment, we're going to focus on development testing, these three parts. And so let's uh, look at each of these in, in turn. Um, the important aspect about development testing is that it should happen iteratively. So again and again during development, not just once. Um, because otherwise you do a lot of development and then when you start testing you find a lot of errors. Uh, so it's a lot better idea to interleave that and always do testing quickly after you've developed a new feature, for example. Um, and then you will always, of course, find a couple of bugs, but you can fix them far quicker than if you have to do it all at, uh, at once. Um, here we differentiate between white box and black box testing. White box testing means that the developers themselves write the tests. Um, white box means that you know about the internals of the uh, system here. On the other hand, we also have black box testing where you have people independent from the main developers which only write the tests and which only know what the system is supposed to do, not how the internals of the system look. So it's a black box to them. And that can often uh, be actually more efficient because if you're the developer of the software yourself and you also write the test, then it's very hard to avoid some sort of implicit assumptions about what the software will actually do. And maybe then you leave out a specific test case because you think, oh, this can never happen anyway. I know how it, this is handled internally. Um, but occasionally, of course, you can be wrong about that. So um, then if you write the test yourself, you might actually leave out a couple of important test cases that would be necessary to test, uh, but because you, you think you know how the software will work internally, you don't do that. And if you have uh, black box testing with independent people to uh, developing the test, then they might actually um, uh, be less inclined to, to make assumptions about what the, the internals of the system will do and will actually develop tests that are more useful in general um, than if you have this white box testing. The big di uh, disadvantage, of course, is that you need more people. So this is something that uh, can usually only be done in a larger company. So if you're just a team of three people, then this probably just won't be possible due to resource constraints. Um, but in larger companies, it's quite, uh, quite common to have test engineers or test developers who only develop the tests for other people's code. Or sometimes you can, of course, also do both roles and switch. So one team writes the tests for the other team's code and vice versa. That's also possible. But of course, it's, it's additional, um, additional resources required. All right, so uh, a very common type of testing is unit testing. And the idea here is that we test each class, meaning each unit of source code on its own. And ideally, we would like to execute all the methods, access all the attributes, and uh, also go through all the internal states that this class might have. Um, the problem now is that uh, usually one class doesn't really exist on its own. It also always communicates with other classes. And for these reasons, we often need something called uh, mock objects or also test harnesses to simulate the rest of the system so we can actually test each unit on its own. 
Um, if we want to uh, test all internal states, then we actually need to know what internal states that class has. This might actually be a problem when you do black box testing because um, the test developers don't know about the uh, internals of the class and are actually aren't supposed to know about the internals of the class. So this, these requirements are kind of difficult to, to reconciliate. Um, on the other hand, the advantages of black box testing are usually uh, higher. So um, to just know about the internal states doesn't often help you a lot. Um, it might still be a goal to achieve in your testing, but again, it requires internal knowledge. All right. Um, next step up would be so-called component or system testing. So we do um, now we combine multiple units, uh, multiple classes uh, into building blocks. We integrate them. So therefore, it's also called integration tests. And now we look at the interface between the subunits. And there's actually quite a, a number of errors that uh, can occur at the interface between units. So we have, uh, even if each unit on its own passes all of its unit tests, then we can still get quite a number of issues when we actually integrate them at the interface between the units. So we can have something like interface misuse, um, just the parameters in the wrong order, for example. Um, this is sometimes also called mystery boolean. So if you have a class that takes four different flags uh, or a method that takes four different flags as a parameter and each of them is a boolean, and then the call in the code will, of course, look something like false, true, true, false. and then it's really hard to, to remember which um, which value corresponds to which flag, for example, and it's really easy to mix the, mix up the order, for example. So that might be a case of interface misuse. Then we might have interface misunderstanding. That means we just uh, make incorrect assumptions about what the, the method we're calling is expecting. Um, for example, if we have a binary search method, then binary search only works on a sorted array. And if we pass an unsorted array to that, uh, to that method, then the, uh, the actual types will still match. It's still an array of, let's say, integers. But uh, if it's unsorted as opposed to sorted, then the binary search will give some very weird results. And so this is simply because we misunderstood uh, what, the, what the interface we're interacting with uh, expects about the data. Um, and last but not least, we also add interface, uh, interfaces between units. We can have timing errors, especially if we have concurrent um, parts of the system. So if we have individual components running at different speeds, uh, then we, it might happen that the data that we access is, uh, is outdated. Um, or we might get race conditions where the system actually sometimes works and sometimes fails because just of the, the order that individual uh, units access the data and exchange data. So uh, these are quite hard to debug, these sort of timing errors, but this is also a very, very common type of, um, of interface error. All right, so uh, there's actually kind of a, a, a meme uh, that is called two unit tests and zero integration tests. So I'll leave that here for you to, to have a look at. Um, these are very real world examples of things that obviously work on their own, but do not work in, in conjunction with each other. So um, obviously everybody's tested each individual thing on its own, but not the combination of them. And there's uh, actually quite a few more examples like this if you if you search for this term. Um, all right, but uh, now let's continue with the uh, automation of testing. This is also something very important. So you shouldn't actually do have to do the tests manually, but you should uh, figure out some way to do that Autom in an automated manner. One very common example is that immediately after you make a commit to your revision control systems, the tests are uh, executed. And if you use some kind of test framework that usually gives you a lot of structural support to design your tests into your code immediately. In general, there's three phases. First of all is the setup phase, 
where you initialize the object you want to test and also uh, any any additional environment you need, like for example any mock objects you need to communicate with, then you ex actually execute uh, a method with uh, certain parameter parameters and then um, Afterwards, in the assertion phase, you check the results if they match what you expect. And if you have larger projects, then these um, these tests are usually grouped into so-called test suits. Um, so a bunch of, of related tests are then put together into one suit, and uh, then you can al already narrow down errors a little, depending on what, what test suits they, um, they appear in. Um, so how can we translate that to best practices? In general, you should use some kind of test framework, for example, JUnit or CPP unit. Uh, so these are unit testing frameworks, but they can also do integration testing, of course. You should automate them. Uh, so it should only take one single command to build all of your code and run the tests. Uh, that if you have, have this sort of automation, then you can also combine it with your revision control system. Um, so you can then use these uh, commit and or, or push hooks to trigger the test. That means hooks means these are scripts that are executed after one of these operations is executed. So for example, in the exercise, when you push your code to GitHub, then it will actually automatically execute uh, uh, the tests on Travis, uh, which is also a testing framework, for example. And a uh, big advantage is that you can use a, a specific technique called bisection. I'll come to that in a moment. This is especially interesting if you have uh, very large change sets. Um, then, in general, it's also a good idea to use weird or extreme uh, values as test cases. So always use a null pointer. If you have floating point values, for example, use not a number or something like minus zero, which you can also represent as a float. Uh, if you have integers, use the, the maximum and the minimum integer values uh, and see what happens. If you have any sort of set or collection, then also pass in an empty set or maybe a set with just one value in the set. Um, so all of these um, are kind of extremes, extreme values for your, uh, for your parameters and these are very good test cases to use because they usually uh, quickly help you find um, find issues in your in your code and last but not least if it's possible at all try to write your tests first so first write your tests and uh, think about what your code actually is supposed to achieve what results you want to get for specific values and then you write your code and see if it actually um, actually passes these tests. Of course, that still doesn't mean, as I've said previously, that your code doesn't have errors, but uh, it's it's a very, very important step to getting as little errors as possible. All right, so I already mentioned bisection. This basically means that um, you do binary search in the history of your code. So let's say you have a really large project like the Linux kernel, and here we have something like 20 commits and the last time you tested one specific feature the test passed and now when you when you update and a lot of people have have edited something in in between then now your test fails so what do you do you could just test every one of these revisions however uh, you can also use this idea of bisection which is kind of like binary research and that means first of all you just test the revision halfway between those two where you, here you know it still works, here you know it fails. So now you test the one in the middle. Let's say it's still working here. So that means that the error has had to be uh, introduced somewhere here. So once again, you test the one in the, in the middle between those two points, let's say it fails here, meaning the error has to, had to be introduced somewhere here. So next one again, halfway, let's say it still works here and then we only need to test this last commit and say it fails here. Then we obviously know that 
This is the exact revision where the error was introduced. And instead of having to test uh, 20 or 25 um, revisions, we only had to test four. So this is really helpful if, if you're working with uh, larger projects uh, that also get updated without uh, your individual commits where, sh where other people uh, push code in, then this might help you find the, the exact place where, where an error was introduced quite quickly. All right, so one more thing regarding best practices, especially if you're working in, the, in a team, is to, if, if you have some kind of coding style, then try to follow that. Um, there's tool like Indents, which actually automatically format your code uh, in the right way. Uh, so that everybody uses tabs or spaces for indentation. It doesn't really matter which you use as long as it's consistent. So if you're in a, in a larger team, then it's probably a good idea to, to follow these guidelines if there are any. Uh, and if there are none, then you might try to uh, uh, want to try to agree on some guidelines. Then those team tools which you have available, like revision control systems, issue trackers, discussion forums, you, you should actually use those and for the, the purpose they're designed for. There are two things that really never work out well, which is sending code by email, um, because then you will always like end up with three in incompatible versions and uh, more or less the same happens if you have something like Dropbox then you will usually very quickly end up with three conflicted copies of the same code and nobody ever remembers what, uh, who edited what and which change was where. So for all, instead of all of these things, just use a revision control system like GitHub. And uh, if you have some kind of internal discussion forum for a larger team and an issue tracker, then by all means also use that. All right. So yeah, that's it. Thanks for listening for this third uh, topic block. And um, if there are, once again, any questions, please don't hesitate to use the uh, discussion board in Moodle. Thank you.